Well, welcome to this evening's meeting. Whether this is your first meeting here with us this year or your last or somewhere in the middle, whether you're joining us here in the tent or online or via one of our relays, it's great to have you with us. And it's a particularly warm welcome to those who are joining us from the youth stream tonight. Great to have you with us. Great to have you with us. Yeah. We've been encouraging everyone to uh, connect with us via social media this week using the hashtag KESCON23. And we've got a few more that have come in uh, over the last couple of days. This is from Lucy, who finally made it up to the mountain with some friends. Looks like they've got a good view from up there. I think this one is from the youth team. He went up um, the trig yesterday. All the teams seem to be going up Latrig. Yeah, yeah, having a great time in the sunshine. And we've got one more from Penelope. Share this image from the evening celebration. Great to see so many old friends and new meeting at the convention. Thanks for sending those in. Do keep sending them in, um, particularly if you're here next week. We'd love to have some more of those. Let me just pray as we start our time together. Father, we come here tonight expectant. Father, we are spiritually hungry and thirsty. Father, we need you. We need your word of truth. We need reassurance. We need to know your love. Some of us need to be disciplined by you. Father, we need to have hope. And so we ask that you would be amongst us in power tonight through your word, by your spirit, that you would be building your church and that you'd be bringing great glory to your son. We ask this in his name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. Please join us. We have a Saviour who hears our voice. When we cry out in sorrow, He turns tragedy to triumph. Full of wonder, full of fear Come behold His power and glory Yet with confidence draw near For the one who holds the heavens And commands the stars above Is the God who bends to bless us With an unrelenting love Rejoice! Sing the 
sickness, all our sorrow, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry. Amen, amen. Please have a seat. 
One of the reasons I love being involved in the convention is the desire, the passion uh, to, to reach out, to, to spread the great news of the Lord Jesus to those that we're rubbing shoulders with, uh, but also those overseas and, and beyond as well. And um, I want to present to you an idea of how you might do that with those in your locality, whether it's while you're here on, uh, on holiday or as you go home to reach your whole neighborhood. Twice a year, we produce a magazine called Life Magazine, which has all sorts of articles and interviews, test me stories, as well as kind of money-saving advice, some recipes, these sorts of things that grab people's interest and then present them Christ in the way that we do it. As I say, it comes out twice a year, and there's a number of different ways that you can use it. It's super low cost. We're actually going to do, what we're going to do, we're going to do 20 copies for 10 quid, okay, so 50p, not a pound, as it says there, and um, you, could, you could obviously buy a couple of copies and give them out to, to the people that you, you meet, maybe on the train or the bus home, however you're going, um, but then maybe get 20 copies and reach your whole street, and uh, maybe with a little note saying, I'm just back on, for, from holiday, picked up this, thought you might be interested, and then maybe get into conversation as time goes by. But also something that you could consider for your whole church to be involved with, for 10p more, we can deliver this to every home in your neighborhood. For 10p more, your your whole neighborhood could hear about your church because we can also customize for your church with perhaps your Christianity Explore details or your church service time. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could get thousands of these out for such low cost, but present them Christ? I'll leave it with you, see what you can do, and see how you can get it out. Now, tonight, I, uh, we've got one last book I want you to get, and it's just a quid. You can throw your pound in the bucket, but through the generosity of, of somebody of the convention, if you're here in the, um, from, from the youth work up to the 90s, 24s, on the condition you read five pages or more, you can have this for free, okay? And we will be testing you. Don't, don't get one and put it on eBay. It's called Roadmap to Jesus by Alistair Chalmers. It's a super book, 36 chapters that are just three or four pages long. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he had a conversation with a couple of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he went through the whole story of, of, of the law and the prophets of how it concerned him. If you want to know who Jesus is, what he's all about, and how he can totally transform your life, then this book is for you. And uh, it's a quid, but if you're young or look young, you can, have it, uh, you can have it for free. Seriously, get something, not just for yourself, but for those who don't yet know Jesus. And would it be amazing if their life was changed? Well, as some of us are beginning to think about going home at the end of our time here, there's just a couple of things we want to highlight for your consideration. Firstly, we hope you've enjoyed your time at Keswick Convention. Have you enjoyed your time at Keswick Convention? Good. That's always a relief to hear. Um, And we hope you've been really well fed and refreshed. We really do want this to be an event that's accessible for all people to be able to come to. And part of that is a commitment to keep it free for people to come to. But as you can imagine, an event like this is not free for us to put on. Uh, There are lots of costs involved in it. And the average cost to put on the convention is £135 per adult per week. So we want you to just uh, have a think about if you can prayerfully and carefully consider giving to Keswick Ministries for your time here this week. We know that for some of you, this is too much to consider this year. And we've been really grateful for the generosity of people in the past that have been able to pay a bit more than that to enable those for whom that price would be prohibitive. And so if that's you, we'd like you to think if you could prayerfully and carefully consider giving above that to enable others who may not be able to, to still access Keswick Ministries. There are several ways in which you can give. There are still uh, physical stations around the site at the back of the main tent in the base camp and at reception. Or if you'd prefer to pick up a giving form, you can do that from reception or the base camp. Take it home and pray over it, consider it, and then send it back. Or if you can manage it, you can go online and donate via our website where you can either give a one-off donation or set up a um, standing order to give more regularly. Thank you for your partnership both in being here, joining with us, but also in giving to the ministries in this way. Wonderful. And one other notice, remember that you can 
catch up on seminars. Some of you have struggled to be able to choose which seminar you, you've wanted to go to. We can catch up on seminars, morning Bible readings, and evening celebrations online, and that's totally free. But if you would like any of that in a USB form, maybe for yourself, for a gift for someone else, remember that you can order USB sticks from the Keswick Ministry stand or reception or online so that you can enjoy that in an accessible form. End of notices. Thank you very much. It's always good to get They to clearly haven't been here every night. Uh, um, end of notices. Um, one thing I've loved um, and I love every year about being at Keswick is um, people coming up to me on the street and just sharing something of what the Lord's been doing in their life, something that they've been encouraged by or challenged by in the ministry. Um, and it's great to hear what the Lord is doing. It's great as the word goes out, the Lord has been at work. I don't know if you've experienced that yourself. Um, and on Wednesday, we heard from Count Everyone In, what God was doing there. And we're going to hear what the Lord's been up to amongst our youth and kids. And I'm going to invite Phil up to tell us. Phil's a bit of a hero. He's been with, our, he's been with my eldest son. And I think he needs a round of applause for that. <laughs> and one thing we're committed to at Keswick is all learning as a family. So the kids have been doing what the adults have been doing in the morning Bible reading, which is looking at 1 John. Imagine looking at 1 John with a six-year-old. That's extraordinary. Thank you, Phil. How have you found teaching the truths of 1 John to seven, um, five to seven-year-olds? It's been fantastic, John T. Um, so to give you a, an idea of scale, well, there's about 200 3 to 11-year-olds here this week, uh, which we've divided into three age groups so that we can better respond to their different uh, attention spans. I've been with the 5 to 7s, and each morning we've given them a five-minute talk, followed by some craft, songs, games, and maybe some drama or puppetry thrown in. Obviously, we can't draw out everything from one John, so over our five sessions, we've settled on just five points linked by a single theme, the children of God. So that's the children of God walk in the light, believe in Jesus, are like their father, love one another, and have life in Jesus. Well, that sounds great. And as I said before, I'm in awe of you guys, and thank you so much for all your work. Give us a couple of highlights from um, your teaching this week in terms of what the Lord's been up to. Well, first, it's been a real pleasure to see the children respond to these truths. Um, last night, I was with the nine-year-olds as they were praying for friends that they find it harder to love. Uh, this morning, a five-year-old ran up to me really excitedly to tell me they'd learned the memory verse. Uh, that's 1 John 4, verse 10, if you're interested. And this afternoon, I heard that one of our four-year-olds had told his mum that he's put his trust in Jesus. Uh, but secondly, I find it... A great encouragement to serve with so many gifted kids leaders, uh, many of whom have come up as kids themselves through this convention. Great. And we're going to hear from the youth work now. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, it really is a joy to hear about some of the families that have been coming to Keswick for years now, coming up and telling me about how their kids or their grandchildren are getting on in the faith now, and how they can trace that back to some of the influence that Keswick has had on them when they were younger. And it's a real delight to share some of that with you this evening as we think about the children and the kids' work and what they've been doing together. We thank God for the children that he has brought to us here this week, and we thank God for the leaders that he has brought and how they have been seeking to share God uh, with the children and young people in their care. Uh, there are many ways in which they've been doing that in their sessions, and Andy Atchison has been leading the youth, and he's going to come now and share with us something about what he's been doing with them, and then he's got some people to help him do a bit more. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Thanks, uh, youth team, you can't take them anywhere. Um, we have had a great week in 1 John. Have you all enjoyed looking at 1 John together this week? It's been brilliant. We've seen that, that believing in Jesus means that we belong to his people and it means becoming more like him. We've explored the theme of human quite a lot. In our seminar streams this week, we've been looking at what does it mean to be human. We've done a, a Bible overview of the body. We've seen that our bodies are created, fallen, redeemed, and one day will be remade. In another stream, we thought about how 
Jesus is king of our bodies. He's king of our relationships. He's king of our emotions. And he's king of our hearts and minds. In our evenings this week, we've had a wonderful time thinking about Jesus. Jesus, God who wore a body for us, the word made flesh. And we took the word human and we we made an acrostic with it to think about the nature and attributes of Christ. So we've, we've seen that Jesus is humble, understanding, merciful, authoritative, and near. We also had a lot of fun in our late night with the theme of Eurovision. <laughs> I'll say no more. Um, we're really encouraged, friends. Uh, we've seen young people come to faith this week, amen? We've seen young people have their faith strengthened. We've seen young people commit with new resolve to live for Jesus in this world. I'm convinced that there's nowhere harder in this country to live out loud for Jesus than in our secondary schools, where our culture screams out a worldview that is not of God. So can I ask you, would you commit to pray for our young people that they will shine for Jesus as he holds them fast. A highlight each year in our 11 to 14s ministry is learning a memory verse. And this year we chose uh, 1 John 3 verse 1, a favorite I know of many of us. We changed the words ever so slightly so they'd fit the tune. Um, So it goes like this, uh, children of God, that is what we are, lavished on us now all of God's great love. Know this now, the world does not know us all because they never knew the Lord. And you lot are in for such a treat because our 11 to 14s team have agreed, some of them have agreed, to come and share the memory verse with us. So up you come, guys. Yeah. Aren't they magnificent? They really are. If you are an 11 to 14-year-old and you are here, please, please join in the actions. Um, But guys, over to you. So good evening, everyone. We're going to be running through the memory verse, which is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, We'll be running through it twice, but for the first time around, to teach the grown-ups how excellent the youth have been, I'd like to invite any of those in the 11 to 14s, if you'd be brave enough to stand up and join us as we teach. And then the second time around, if everyone would be happy to join in. Give them a round of applause. One, two, three, four. Children of God, that is what we are. Lavished on us now, all of God's great love. Know this now. That the world does not know us, all because they never knew the Lord. One just well done. <laughs> well done, everyone. So, grown ups, I think that you've heard that once. I think that is enough. Would you be happy to stand up? <laughs> And join in with us as we go through 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. Children of God, that is what we are. Lavished on us now, all of God's great love. Know this now, that the world does not know us. All because they never knew the Lord. 1 John 3, verse 1. Well done, you can sit down. <laughs> wow, that was, that was hard. I don't think I can. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> the 19 to 24s team um, have gone home, but I had a little chat with them, and they've had a great time as well. Um, they've been looking at the Lord's Prayer and thinking how that should shape their prayer lives, and wisely, they've just made a bit of space for them to process the stuff that they've been he- hearing in the evening celebrations and in other contexts and praying through that. I think it'd be great just to pray that all of these seeds of God's word that have gone out through the week would, bre- would bear much life-changing fruit in our young people and our children. Anne's going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, 
We give you great thanks for all that's been going on across the different programs this week. We pray for the children that they might indeed be children of God. We pray for our youth, especially as they go back and into the secondary school culture. Lord, we pray that they would not be afraid to shine like stars for you in that culture. May they remember the truths they've learnt here and may that uh, impact the way they live their lives. Lord, for the young adults, we thank you for the truths of the Lord's Prayer, and we pray that they would really sink deep into their hearts. And we thank you too for the team, Lord, and we pray that you would bless them too as they have served and given out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now over to James. At the end of each convention, I have the uh, great privilege and responsibility as well to say on your behalf a huge number of thank yous. It's an extraordinary effort that goes into making this convention happen, as you can tell. I wonder if you could wait till the very end and the signal before applause. Is that okay? There are quite a few groups. Right, so we're going to start with our wonderful band, Emu. Thank you so much for leading us with joy, with faithfulness, um, a, a congregational singing. This is not a band that draws attention to themselves, that they lead with joy. They lead God's people, and I really notice that, and I hope we all do. So thank you so much, Emu. It's wonderful, as always, having you. Thanks so much to the speakers on the main platform here, in the seminars, lecture. Thank you to Count Everyone In for hosting the program for adults with learning disabilities. It's wonderful having you. Thank you for 90s to 24s. Thank you for the children and youth leaders, an extraordinary number of leaders make that happen, and what an extraordinary impact that makes on people's hearts and lives. I'm going to draw attention to many others on a rolling slide in a few moments, and we'll see all those different groups, tech and many others behind the scene, but two particular groups just to highlight. One is the staff team. Thank you so much for being an incredible staff team. It's an amazing privilege working with you. The vision, the values, the heart, the dedication, the thoroughness is extraordinary to see. And a huge thank you to to volunteers. Take something like around 600 or so, give or take, depends year on year slightly, volunteers to run this convention. And each person gives of themselves and serves in extraordinary ways, which is just so wonderful to see. I say, some are visible, some are behind the scenes, and we would never see them. But a huge thank you. If you if we're always looking for volunteers, so do head to the Keswick Ministries stand, or pick up a little orange leaflet when you go out, or you can go to the website to register interest in volunteering. Amazingly, this year, when I think it was in the articles and the newspapers and saying how hard it was to find volunteers and many other events have been struggling, we were basically full and running waiting lists at the end of May, which was absolutely astonishing. But also, before we do the applause, a huge thank you to you for coming. It's a big venture to come. It's an outlay. It's uh, obviously it's a slightly uncertain thing. You, the theme human, what's that going to be about? But thank you for being, I see so many smiling faces and encouragement. It's an absolute joy and privilege to be part of this ministry. Now's your moment. Thank you very much. We're going to sing together now. Revelations gives us a picture of every living creature on heaven and earth declaring this, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Please would you stand and let's praise Jesus together. For the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who
more than 
Please take a seat. Well, as we've just sung, God's word is more than just words. Its treasures are endless, and it's more than enough. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the truths it contains, for the hope, for the joy, for the treasure it holds. And thank you that this treasure endures forever. Please bless us with those truths now as Paul comes to speak to us. Amen. Well, good evening. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 7. And we're going to have a passage read to us in just a few moments. Uh, when we turn to the book of Revelation, sometimes people get phased. Isn't it very complicated? Isn't it very difficult to grasp? Well, actually, it's God's picture book. It's a book that is written to help Christians who are struggling. They're going through great tribulation. And the word tribulation is a Greek word that literally means to be crushed. You're under immense pressure. You're, you're hated by the world. And that's what was happening in the first century. John himself is in prison. It's a kind of a first century concentration camp. The Christians are being martyred. And what does God do? He gives them this wonderful vision. The immediate context is chapter 7, which is, or sorry, chapter 6, which is a picture of God's judgment. It's a terrifying picture. Uh, and the people of the world cry out, hide us from the face of him who sits on the, on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who can stand in the day of God's judgment? And the answer comes in chapter 7. The first part of the chapter is all about those who are God's servants, who are sealed forever and secure. And then the second part gives us a wonderful picture, a vision of glory, which is for every one of us tonight who's a true Christian. So we're going to hear the word of God. Revelation 7, picking it up at verse 9. After this, I looked... And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. And to the Lamb, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. If you have your Bibles, turn to that passage. And uh, we've only got 30 minutes this evening, so we're just going to concentrate on the last three verses, verses 15, 16, and 17. And we're going to be thinking tonight of the glorious destiny that every Christian has. And it's good to think about that, isn't it? 
Uh, we have a number of grandchildren, and our youngest is a little boy called Boaz. And when Boaz was born, I decided I'd take the opportunity to tell um, the family, to tell my grandchildren the story of Ruth and Boaz. Wonderful story. And so we went through the story, and, and what a great guy Boaz was. Well, afterwards, two of my granddaughters were overheard by their mum speaking together. And one said, wouldn't it be amazing if when Boaz grows up, he meets and falls in love with a little girl called Ruth, and they get married? Wouldn't that be great? And a sister said, it'd be marvellous. Granddad would be so excited. <laughs> He'd be so excited at that wedding, wouldn't he? And then she thought for a minute, and she said, but he'll probably be dead by then. <laughs> well, it does kind of focus the mind. What does it mean to be human? That's been our theme this week, hasn't it? What is, what is it to be human? Well, to be human is to struggle with many of the dark questions of life. Of course, one of the darkest questions of all is death itself. Somehow, there's something inside us that cries out, this isn't the way it should be. God's put eternity in our hearts, and yet, and yet people die. And it's just, just the way it is. And, and some people say, well, there's nothing after that. That's just the end. I was preaching in Glasgow recently. Anybody from Glasgow? You'll understand what I'm about to say. I was there, I was just talking about life. And afterwards, this guy said, oh, there's no life after. When you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> and that was, for many people, the answer. It's just it. But, but there's something inside that says, no, there's more than that. To be human is to struggle with that question. And to be human is to struggle with the question of grief. You see, to be human is to love. And love leads to loss. And loss breaks our hearts. You don't want to lose anything, well, don't love. But when we love, we lose. Like the man who says to me, you know, my wife, we were together for over 50 years. Early in the morning when I wake up, and I'm still halfway between sleep and wake, I reach out in the bed for her. And she's not there. And I come into reality and realize she's not there. Or the young couple in my first church who had the tragedy of a cot death. You know, you have a funeral, and there's this tiny little coffin. And, and there on a cold hillside in Wiltshire, in a graveyard, this, this coffin is placed. And the husband calls me out on a very cold night, and I, I go to see his wife, and, uh, and he, he says, Pastor, you've got to help her. And she says, Pastor, you, you, you're going to want to throw me out of the church when I tell you what I'm thinking. You see, my heart is yearning for my little boy. And... I just want to go up on the hillside and take a blanket and put it over the grave to keep him warm. I know it's stupid. I know he's with the Lord, but I'm yearning for him. You're going to want to throw me out of the church, aren't you, Pastor? I said, no, I want to hug you and I want to tell you about Jesus. But that's to be human, isn't it? In a fallen, broken world, death and tragedy and heartbreak are realities. And to be human is to feel those things. And into that whole conundrum of, of pain and suffering, with all the questions that, that life throws up, we have this wonderful statement. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, in the early church, they used to do that. Christ is risen, and the congregation came back. He is risen indeed. Can we get away with that on the last night of week one? Okay, here we go. Christ is risen. Well done, well done. And of course, in the book of Revelation, that's who he is. That's the opening vision. Christ is the one who's conquered death. And at his belt, he holds the keys of death and Hades. Death has been trampled underfoot. And so he can bring a word of hope to his people. And that's what he actually does here in our verses this evening. So let's look together at verses 15 and 16 and 17. This place that Christ has gone to prepare for us, this wonderful place of hope that the resurrected Lord is preparing for us at this very moment in time, what kind of place is it? Well, three things. Number one, it's a place of service. It's a place of service. Verse 15, therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. Well, we may well ask the question, who are they and where are they and what are they doing? Well, who are they? Earlier in the chapter, uh, the angel has said to, to John, who are they? 
It's not that the angel doesn't know, it's that he wants John to know. John's already seen this great multitude. I mean, there's a lot of people here tonight, but I'm guessing you could count them. But when you get to heaven, you can't count them. There are just so many of them. This huge number, and, 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 the, and the living creature says, you know, who are they? And John says, well, I don't know, you know. I'll tell you, they are those who've come out of great tribulation, and they've washed their robes, and they've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have been in tribulation. The word tribulation there is the Greek word thlipsis, and it literally means to be crushed. They are a crushed people. They've been crushed by the world. Remember, Jesus in John's gospel uses exactly the same word. In the word, in the world you will experience crushing. We heard a little earlier how difficult it is to be a young person today. Hardest place to be a Christian is in a high school. And you know, you young people, what it is to be crushed because of your faith. But they come out of that crushing. They're now in God's presence. And they are those who are washed white in the blood of the Lamb. They're wearing white robes. See, it's talked about heaven, but we need to remember that heaven isn't for everybody. It's for those who've trusted in Christ. Heaven is a holy place because God's a holy God, and only those who are dressed in the robes of righteousness can get there. It's not good people. It's people who have come as sinners to Christ and trusted him alone. Our sins, though they are as red as crimson, will be as white as snow. And in the gospel, he clothes us in the robes of righteousness so that we can stand before the throne of a holy God. Without fear, bold, I approach the eternal throne. See, the gospel is not just that you are forgiven, it's that you are made completely right with God. Doesn't that blow your mind? Say yes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Amazing. In Birmingham, there's a hill called the Licky Hills. It's a wonderful place. I proposed to my wife there. And when you look in one direction, you can see the beautiful hills of Worcestershire. When you look in the other direction, you can see the city of Birmingham, like the new Jerusalem coming down <laughs> out of heaven. You can't see them both at the same time. If you're looking at the city, you can't see the hills. If you do a 180 and you look at the hills, you can't see the city. When we become Christians, God does two things. He takes all our sins and he puts them behind his back. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he looks at us and he doesn't look at us as if we're, okay, you're neutral now and, and, and try better. He clothes us in the white robes of righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ upon us. And he's satisfied. And we're able to go to heaven. If you're not a Christian tonight, you're not going to heaven. But you can, if you'll bow the knee to King Jesus. That's who they are. Where are they? They're before the throne. Well, where is the throne of God? I'm not sure where it is at the moment. It's in a real place. It's where Jesus went after his ascension. It's where the souls of the departed saints are, but one day it will be here. Heaven will descend, the throne of God will descend, the new Jerusalem will descend, and here in this new creation, they will worship him and serve him forever. That's who they are, that's where they are, and what are they doing? They are serving him forever. The word service there is, is partly a, a word that describes worship. It's, it's a place which is active and busy. I, I don't know what you think of when you think of heaven. Do you think of a kind of a wonderful rest home? As a pastor, I used to, I used to go to um, visit folk in rest homes. And my wife would always say, when you go, make sure you wear a short-sleeved shirt. Because they're so hot. And you go in and it, it's, like, it's like tropical conditions. That's why everybody's asleep. <laughs> uh, and they wake up occasionally and they, they share the latest news about the development of their bunions. And then, then they go back to sleep again. And you think of heaven like that. Well, stop thinking like that. Yes, it's a place of rest, but it's a place of activity. It's a place of glorious worship. It's a place of, of adventure. It's a wonderful place. There is rest, and there's rest from the battle with sin. And there's rest from trials, and there's rest from troubles, and there's rest from heartache. You know, I, I, I've been a Christian now for... 56 years. I know that looks impossible. <laughs> I was converted when I was minus 10. <laughs> but uh, shall I tell you what is my biggest trouble, my biggest heartbreak? It is my daily battle with sin. 
When I was a teenager, I battled with sin. I thought, when you get into your 30s, you'll have conquered it. And I got into my 30s, and I thought, well, it's just as bad, if not worse. When you get into your 50s, you'll conquer it. And you know what? When I got into my 50s, it was still there. And then I thought, when you get into your 60s, when you're 60, you're over the hill, aren't you? You know, that's it. You know, life is easy. No, I'm 67, and life is still a battle every day, a battle against sin. I hate it. And it's going to be a battle all the way. But when you get to heaven, you rest from sin forever. Isn't that good news? Yes. Thank you. You're, you're, you're learning to say yes. So, so there we are. But it's, it's more than that. It is a place of service. What do we mean by that word service? Well, it, it does mean worship. It means worship at the nth degree. If you look back in the passage, that's what they're doing. Have a look at verse 10. This great multitude cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Their, their focus, the worship of, of God's people is, is on God himself in all his glory and on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the angels and all the living creatures join in in verse 11. It's very interesting. If you look at verse 12, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be unto our God forever and ever, amen. They sing about the glory of God, but they can't sing the song of salvation we can because we're saved you ever thought about that angels can sing about salvation we can sing from personal experience I'm a sinner I put my hand up I'm a sinner but oh by the grace of God I'm a sinner who's been saved by amazing grace and forever and ever I'm going to sing the praises of God and the nearest you ever get to a sense of heaven I think is when you do that I was in a conference once, not Keswick, but it was a conference like Keswick, and we'd come to the final evening like this, and we'd come to the very end of the evening, and everything was done and dusted, and, and they'd said the last uh, benediction. And then in this huge congregation, suddenly, one of the members of the congregation started up singing, There is a Redeemer. And everybody joined in. It wasn't scripted. They just joined in. You know, thousands of voices. Without music, a cappella, just singing, there is a redeemer. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. And there I'll serve my king forever in that holy place. And it was one of those moments when you get that tingle down your spine. And you think, what will it be like to be in heaven, to sing his praises forever? All oh, the joy of heaven. My great hero was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and, 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 and it was said, I mean, that in those days, in the 19th century, that the worship was pretty dour compared with today, but, but it was said that when people went, they were struck by the joy of the singing and, and, and the joy of his preaching. You know, just this act of worship bubbling over with joy. And a lady didn't like it. She wrote to him. She said, Mr. Spurgeon, I, I came to your tabernacle on Sunday. It, it, it was far too frivolous. I want to find a church that is more suitably miserable. <laughs> I, I, I could take her to a few churches like that, couldn't you? <laughs> well, if you, if you enjoy singing, well done, because you're preparing for heaven. We worship him day and night in his temple. But of course, it's more than that. The word service is much richer than that. It's more than just a long service of worship. Remember on the very first night, we were talking about human dignity. What, what does it mean to be human? Well, it means to fulfill the mandate that God has given us, to fill the earth and to subdue it. It's a whole life thing. And so what will we do in heaven? We won't just sing God's praises. We will live and love and learn. We'll work and we'll worship and we'll wonder. We'll behold him in his glory and we'll build. We'll bask in the glory of God. It is a place of feasting and festivity and fulfillment. We'll create, we'll cultivate, we'll celebrate. I'm sure that in heaven we will experience what Adam and Eve would have experienced hadn't they fallen. But more than that, forever and ever and ever we will grow in, in perhaps capacities of things we've never done before. I, I, I'm not musical. It, it, when you've got a pastor who isn't musical, it's sometimes an advantage actually because some pastors are too musical when they come to criticize the, the, uh, the musician. I just love them. I've loved the music this week, haven't you? Yeah. And it's been great and I've just, I mean, I don't know anything about it, but I've just loved it. But maybe in... in, 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 in um, in heaven, I'll get to play a musical instrument. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Maybe, maybe in the Keswick of heaven, I'll get to, on, on the platform to play a harp. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Or a guitar, or, 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 I don't know. Music and art and science to boldly go where no one has ever been before and to experience, yes. 
and to, and to look at the universe. It's a place of service. Number two, it's a place of shelter. It's a place of shelter. Look at the end of verse 15. He will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The, the sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. Forever and ever protected by the presence of God. The, the, the Greek there is quite interesting. The one sitting on the throne will spread his tent over them. The story of Ruth and Boaz, she goes to Boaz and she says, will you, will you spread the corner of your garment over me? In other words, will you take me into that place of shelter, that place of security, that intimate place where I know that I'm accepted by you? When I was courting my wife, I used to have one of these big, long, black duffel coats. And we'd go for a walk, and she would say, you know, it's really cold today. Can I come under your duffel coat? And so I'd lift up my arm, and she'd put her hand around me, and she would come under the shelter of my duffel coat. What amazed me was on a sunny day, <laughs> she was always cold. <laughs> I don't know. But that's the imagery here. He will shelter you under the shadow of his wing. You are safe forever. I, I, I think on the first evening, I, I think we were reminded that, that the great thing about Eden was, was what a wonderful, but one of the disadvantages of Eden was that there was a door out of it, but there's no door out of heaven. We're secure forever and ever. We're in his presence forever. He shelters us forever, never to be departing. One of the great preachers of a previous generation was A.W. Tozer. When he was a young pastor, he was asked to go and speak to a lady who was dying. And he said, I, 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 I fumbled a few words and I prayed with her and I rose to leave. And she said, uh, young man, are you nervous? <laughs> he said, yes, I've never spoken to someone who was dying. He said, look, you don't need to be nervous. I'm not. I know I've got to die. I've got to cross the river and I know that the river is cold and it's dark and it's deep and I've never been that way before. But let me let you into a secret. My father owns the land on both sides. And he owns the river in between. And he's never let me down yet, and he never will. Never let me down yet, and he never will. And here's the security. If you're a Christian, you are secure. First part of the chapter talks about that. You're stamped with the seal of God. You're safe forever. He will bring you through that river of death. And he'll land you safe on Canaan's side. Look at the way in which he describes this place of shelter. It's a place, if you look at the next verse, verse 16, where they never hunger, they never thirst, the sun doesn't beat down on them, there's no scorching heat. It's a picture of a pilgrim. And the pilgrimage to heaven is hard. And some of you know that tonight, don't you? Some of you tonight are struggling. You're struggling with pain, you're struggling with temptation, you're struggling with heartbreak with disappointment you've got to go home tomorrow and things at home are not good well God will be with you and God won't let you go and one day he will lean, land you in this place where it is perfect as it says later in chapter 21 that series of glorious negatives no tears no death no mourning no crying no pain in heaven, there's no hospitals, no funerals, no cemeteries, no broken homes, no broken hearts, no spectacles or wheelchairs or heart disease or, or diabetes or cancer or AIDS or Alzheimer's or grief or sin or dementia or schizophrenia or disaster or disease or death. In new resurrection bodies, we worship him forever. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be when I started in ministry? I, I, I do love a strong handshake, don't you? Can't stand a wet fish. And I'd stand at the door and these dear old ladies would come out and I'd take them by the hand and they'd jump in the air. Rheumatism! Pastor, rheumatism! And then they'd look at me in the eye and they'd say, you wait, <laughs> you wait. No rheumatism in heaven. It's home. Isn't there a wonderful frisson of that word home? Little boy was asked, what is home? Home is a place when you get there, they've got to let you in. My wife and I have just returned, uh, uh, returned, retired to Birmingham. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I was going for a walk early in the morning, and I see these guys at 6 o'clock in the morning. He's taking his dog for a walk, and it's a beautiful day, and he, he said to me, it's going to be a lovely day today, isn't it? Completely bossed in. And I thought, oh, 
Isn't it be wonderful where they speak proper like what I do? <laughs> where they speak the king's English. The language of Shakespeare. You know Shakespeare was almost a Brummie. <laughs> you know, it, to buy or not to buy, that's the question. <laughs> Home. Home forever. <coughs> place of shelter. But then, thirdly and finally, this is a place of satisfaction. It's a place of satisfaction. Look at verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. <laughs> that is one of those oxymorons, isn't it? The lamb as a shepherd. But, but John has seen the lamb earlier, hasn't he? he? He's been told the only one who can reign and bring about God's purposes on earth is the lion of Judah. And he looks for the lion and what does he see? A lamb who is slain. He's still the good shepherd. He still guards his people. He still knows them. He still loves them. He still protects them. And what does he do? He leads them, verse 17, to springs of living water. Heaven isn't just the absence of pain. It's the abundance of joy. It's the abundance of life. Later on in chapter 21, he speaks of the river of the water of life, abundant and constant and healing and refreshing. And then right at the end, the most intimate picture of all, and God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will wipe away the tears. In the Greek, it's very interesting. It's not just that he will wipe away the tears. It's almost he will wipe out the tears as if he removes tears forever. Because the ultimate hope of heaven is, is that vision of God. They will see his face. They will be in his presence forever. They will gaze on the glory of Lamb. That's what, it, that's what is the heart of what it means to be human. Our human dignity is that we will be in a relationship with God forever. That's what we were made for. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, and the tragedy of, of the fall was that he was exiled from God. But straight away, God begins to make a plan. I will bring you back into a relationship with myself. He says to Abraham, for example, I will be your shield, and I will be your very great reward. I will give myself to you. In the words of the covenant in the Old Testament, I will be your God, you will be my people. What's the heart of heaven? It's God himself. And it's Christ himself. He says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in glory. What do we long for in heaven to see Jesus? You know, when the people have sinned against God and, and the Lord says, I'll give you the promised land, but I won't go with you. And they grieve because they say, well, we don't want the land without God. It's nothing without the Lord. We want the Lord. We want to see him. We want to be in his presence. And that's the hope of heaven. To gaze on Jesus forever and ever and ever. One of the great preachers of another century was William Sangster up in London, Methodist up in London. And one day he was visited by um, an old uncle. He was a, a, a country boy, never visited London before. And Sangster said, now what would you like to do? And, and the old boy said, I, I'd like to go and, and see a performance of Messiah. Handel's Messiah. And so they, they arranged it, and he was there watching the Messiah, sitting near the front. And they got to the point where they sing about Jesus, and, and he will reign forever. King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will reign forever. And Sangster looks across at the old boy, and the tears are rolling down his cheeks. And in a loud whisper, he says, that's my saviour they're singing about. That's my saviour. King of kings. Lord of lords. And he will reign forever. It may be tough following Jesus, but if you follow Jesus, you get Jesus. <laughs> and it's worth it. Of course it's worth it. Our experience of Christ, our experience of God, this, this life, it's just, it's just, it's just slight. Imagine a little boy and he's never been to the sea before and you take him to the sea and, and you say, what's it like? And he puts his hand and he says, it's wet. And then he puts his hand to his lips and he says, it's salty. And then he looks up and he says, it's big. Well, he knows a bit about the sea. Everything he says is correct. It, it is wet and it is salty and it is big. But, but that's just a tiny, a tiny taste of what it is. And our knowledge of Christ and our knowledge of God now is just that little bit of it. But we've got eternity to enjoy him total satisfaction of what it means to be human, to be with God's people forever and ever. And that's what it means. That's what it means.
to be truly human. Our conference this week has been about what it means to be human. As we close, and I've only got a couple of minutes, let me introduce you to a very small and very dear little human being. There he is. <laughs> He's my little Welsh grandson. He's called Abraham, or Abe. When Abe was born, it was discovered that he had a very, very profound neurological problem. It's got a Latin name, but what it means basically is a smooth brain. The brain never developed in the womb, which means that at birth and now, five years on, he has no higher functions. He can't do what a newborn baby can do. He'll never speak, he'll never walk, he'll never talk. Um, he has all oh, such severe epileptic fits that he actually breaks his own bones. During, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. And there would be people who would say, well, of course, what's the point of that? Wouldn't it have been better if his parents had discovered and, and, and he didn't live? Or, or even now that they just didn't care and let him go? My response to that is, how dare they say that? This little boy has unique human dignity. He is made in the image of God. I look at the way in which my daughter cares for Abe and I see what the love of God is like. She speaks to him as if he is the most precious thing in her life. His sisters call him the golden prince. <laughs> he has dignity because he's human. With all his problems, he has dignity. And our theme tonight, he has destiny. I believe there's enough teaching in the Bible to tell us that one day we will see him in a new resurrection body, in the place that we've just been thinking about. This stunningly handsome young man will come across to us and he'll introduce himself and we'll know that he's Abraham because he's got a Welsh accent. <laughs> Friends, every one of us has dignity and every one of us has destiny. But the question tonight is, what is your destiny? If you're a Christian, the destiny is what we've just been describing, and it's fantastic, and it's wonderful, and it's brilliant. But if you're not a Christian tonight, if your robes have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb, that's not your destiny. Every human being is eternal. Every person in this room tonight is eternal. If you take a piece of paper, and you put a dot on the piece of paper, and then you draw a line, and the line goes on and on and on to eternity, that dot represents your life whether it's 50 years or 100 years, whatever it is, it's a dot compared with eternity. And you will spend eternity in this place or in a place that the Bible calls hell. I don't want to be heavy about this tonight, but I'm just being faithful to the book of Revelation, which makes it as clear as, as probably any other, any other book. Earlier, the, the, the question has been asked, who will hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb? See, Jesus Christ is both the saviour of sinners and the judge. You either come to him as saviour or you appear before him as judge. And I want to plead with you tonight on this very last night of Keswick, just be sure that you've come to him as saviour. I became a Christian when I was 11 years old. I didn't come from a Christian family. I came under conviction of sin. I came to realise I was a sinner and, and, you know, at 11, you don't know much. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed a saviour. And on a night like tonight, I fled to the cross for salvation. 56 years ago, it's as vivid tonight as it was then, and my name was written in heaven. And the moment you believe your name is written in heaven, and you get to experience all this wonderful joy, or you get to be separated from all those things forever, the exact opposite, the, the negative of everything we see. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus died to make it possible for people like you and me to get to heaven. I've got a book which I'll show you in a moment, and I'll give you one of those free. If you're a Christian, and I don't come and get the book if, if you're a Christian already, but if you're not a Christian, you want to find out more, please come and take the book from me. I think that you can get one for free from, from, from uh, 10 of those as well. But as I close, let me ask you a question. Bear in mind you are an eternal being. Where will you be in an hour? Or in a coffee, maybe. Where will you be in a day? One day, probably on your way home. Where will you be in, in a week? Who knows? Where will you be in a year? Probably back here in the tent. Where will you be in 20 years? Some of you won't be here on planet Earth anymore. 
Where will you be in a hundred years? Well, maybe the babies we can hear at the back might survive a hundred, but none of us else will. Where will you be in one hundred million years? What a stupid question. No, because you will be somewhere. You are eternal. You will be in heaven or in hell. And the only way to be sure is to come to Christ. Please, 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 if you never have, come to the shelter of Christ tonight. Here's the book that I'd love to give you. It's got a very appropriate title. It's called Heaven, How I Got There. Don't take one if you're already a Christian, but if you want to find out more, please come to me afterwards. I'll be standing somewhere over there and take one of those. Or get it from 10 of those. Just just use my name. (laughs) But let's pray. Father, we do pray now that in your grace and in your mercy, you would help us to be sure. If we're Christians, we thank you for the hope that we have. We thank you for our dignity. We thank you for our destiny. But Lord, if we're not sure, or tonight, may we flee to the cross for salvation. May we realize that it's in Christ alone and only in him that we can find grace. Amen. We're going to respond by singing together. Please stand and join us. In Jesus we find steadfast love and we find deep and boundless peace. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can see all is mighty and not I but through
Amen. Please take your seats. Please sit down. That almost brings us to the end of the week. Can you believe it? It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Um, but week one isn't quite over yet. And if you'd like to pray, maybe there's something that you just want to bring before the Lord before you go home to wherever you go home to, then the prayer team are here to help. Do make the most of them. And I know that some of you have joined or some of you are staying for week two. Um, Jonathan Griffith, the lead pastor of Metropolitan Bible Church in Ottawa, he'll be leading our Bible readings in Colossians. And remember that you can follow that on YouTube and on the website. And hopefully that'll be a blessing to you. Well, next year's 2024's theme is that of resurrection. And we will be uh, thinking about our risen king and what God's word has to say to us about why resurrection matters. Week one begins on the 13th of July when David Gibson will be coming to uh, speak to us in our Bible readings. We'd love to have you join us. Also, I can't wait. But as we close week one, 2023, let me just give you a moment to pray, maybe reflect, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Tonight we heard those wonderful, wonderful words. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. And Father, how we long for that day. That day when we are safe forever. That day when we are home. That day when we are happy forever. And Father, prepare us for that day. May nobody go tonight without accepting the blood of the Lamb, without being washed in the blood of the Lamb clinging to Jesus and the forgiveness found in him. Father, help us to live in light of that day, whatever the future holds, in the ups and downs of life, the difficulties, the struggles. Help us to live with hope and with joy. Help us to reflect you to a world that longs and needs to know you. And Father, pray that you would keep us going till the end knowing that it is worth it, knowing that heaven is real, knowing that we will be there, we will tread the grass of Jordan if our hands are in your son's hands. How we need your help. How we love you. We pray in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, that does conclude our time together tonight and for this week. But Emu are going to play a few songs for us, so do feel free to stay and join in with them if you'd like to. But if you need to leave, do uh, feel free to do so. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight and online and for this week, and good night. Good night. God glory. Here we stand, the church of the
Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us for week one. Safe travels and God bless.